This video was made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Subscribe on Patreon for early access to videos and additional content. The saying goes that a picture is worth a thousand words, and oftentimes, photographs capture more than just a mere moment in time. Even ordinary looking pictures can hide dark secrets and strange circumstances. In today's episode, we'll be exploring three photographs with chilling backstories. But first, I'd like to thank Hunt a Killer for sponsoring today's episode. Much of the last year and a half has taken so many opportunities for socializing and creating adventures with friends away. We were stuck inside, but now as the world opens up and so many more opportunities arrive to socialize again, the question becomes, how will we pass that time? Well, what if we told you there's a game that's far more likely to make you forget about the isolation than watching another predictable murder mystery? A masterful and mysterious subscription-based detective game delivered directly to your front door that allows you to team up with friends and solve the world's hottest cold cases. Hunter Killer offers monthly interactive crime scenes and promises hours of entertainment, sent via a box full of intricate maps, mind-bending codes, and detailed clues for you to collect and decipher as you sleuth. Whether you're on vacation or simply hosting a friendly get-together, any game night is incomplete without the chance to become a true private eye. And if you're still avoiding travel, Hunter Killer can be played remotely. Just simply share your case files over Zoom or Skype, including booklets full of juicy backstories, sneaky suspects, and special storylines. It's unlike any other form of interactive true crime. We especially appreciate the social aspect of Hunter Killer, which goes beyond case files received every month. Hundreds of thousands of fans have joined to form an eclectic online community to discuss the crime scenes, lend hints, or hang out and just talk about unsolved mysteries. To be a part of this community, viewers can go to hunterkiller.com slash coldcasedetective and use the code coldcasedetective for 20% off your first box. Make sure to use Cold Case Detective at checkout for that 20% discount. So go out there and join us as we hunt a killer. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. Jolie Callan. 18 year old Jolie Callan had her whole life ahead of her. A bright and hard working student, Jolie had plans to move away from home and attend university in the coming months. A popular, petite, and pretty girl, her family knew her best for her big heart. In August of 2015, Jolie agreed to go on a hike with her ex boyfriend, 20 year old Lauren Daniel Bunner in an attempt to move forward as friends. Jolie had recently gotten a new boyfriend, but her kind nature got the better of her, and she thought the hike would be a good opportunity for them to clear the air. The night before the hike, the 18-year-old texted one of her friends and said jokingly, if something happens to me, you'll know who I was with. Chillingly, Jolie had no idea how accurate this text would be. Bunner was not a favorite among Jolie's friends and family. A jealous and possessive boyfriend, he often wanted the 18-year-old to spend all her time with him or with him and his friends. He didn't like that she had her own social life outside of him, and he had frequently threatened to take his own life whenever Jolie attempted to break things off. It was only with her university career looming and the fact that she'd be moving away that finally gave her the courage to split up with Bunner for good. She largely ignored his subsequent pleas for her to take him back. On August 30th, Jolie, her ex-boyfriend, and his dog, Kaiba, made their way through the Chia State Park in Alabama. During the course of the hike, Bunner took several photos of Jolie and posted them to his Instagram. The final image showed the 18-year-old with her back to the camera, 
as she stood on a cliffside and looked out across the mist-shrouded mountains. The post was captioned, Oh, you know, just enjoying the view. After he took this image, Bunner pulled out a gun and shot Jo Lee in the back of the head. Once she collapsed to the ground, Bunner turned her over and shot her again between the eyes before he pushed her off the 40-foot cliff they were standing on. After committing the horrific crime, the 20-year-old returned to his car, where he called 911 and turned himself in, saying, I want to turn myself in for the murder of my ex-girlfriend Jolene Callan that happened just a little while ago on Chia Mountain. From here, Bunner waited for the police to arrive. When they did, they quickly found Jolie's body. Her ex-boyfriend was covered in blood, and the substance was found on his car and his steering wheel, as well as on top of the cliff where Jolie was shot. Despite admitting to the crime when he called 911, Bunner pled not guilty when he was charged with murder. His trial began in November of 2015, during which he attempted to claim that he and Jolie had entered into a murder-suicide pact, which he found he could not go through with after he killed the 18-year-old. He claimed that she'd told him she didn't want to see it coming, which is why he shot her from behind. Jolie's friends and family disputed this idea. She was excited about the future, had been preparing for university, and had started a new relationship. To them, it was more likely that Bunner had slain Jolie in cold blood because she refused to rekindle the couple's relationship. Meanwhile, Bunner's defense claimed that the 20-year-old had Asperger's syndrome and that he should be granted youthful offender status as a result. In Alabama law, any defendant aged 21 or under can file for this status, which guarantees that the defendant will serve no more than three years in prison, regardless of the severity of the crime committed. Naturally, Jolie's loved ones were appalled by this notion. They were further distraught when Bunner was granted this status. The 18-year-old's father, Michael, subsequently called a local ABC affiliate to protest this status. A media frenzy ensued, and the decision to give Bunner this status received massive backlash. The case was already so high profile that Bunner had to be escorted to and from court in a bulletproof vest, and this new decision had the public even more riled up. In December of 2015, it was walked back, and the status was rescinded. The court later heard that Bunner had bragged to his cellmates about killing Jolie, saying if he couldn't have her, no one could. On July 13th of 2017, Bunner pled guilty to murder. The defense asked for leniency, claiming there was evidence that the now 22-year-old was suffering from mental health problems. Regardless of this, he was sentenced, as an adult, to 52 years in prison, although he would be eligible for parole in 15. He was also ordered to pay over $11,000 in restitution to the Alabama Crime Victims Compensation Commission. Although her family will have to live the rest of their lives without Jolie, they are pleased with the outcome and that Bunner was not given youthful offender status. Her father, Michael, said, It's the right thing to do. I mean, come on. You don't get youthful offender in maybe three years for cold-blooded killing somebody. Jolie was a sweet, good girl, and I think she's smiling today. Michael Gargiulo These photos of a man posing with a woman received mixed reactions when posted to Reddit, with some immediately finding them creepy and difficult to look at, while others stating they are just silly photos a couple decided to stage. But upon finding out more about the man in these photos, Many found themselves thinking differently about these seemingly innocent images. Born on February 15th of 1976, Michael Gargiulo is one of California's most twisted serial killers. A native of Glenview, Illinois, Michael is believed to have stabbed his 18-year-old neighbor, Trisha Picaccio, to death on her back doorstep in 1993. Her father found her body the following morning on August 14th. A close friend of Trisha's brother, Michael was a suspect in the case for years, but at the time, the police had no evidence to link him to the horrific crime. Then in 1998, he moved to Los Angeles, allegedly to escape the scrutiny of the Illinois Police Department. 
On February 21st of 2001, Michael stabbed 22-year-old Ashley Ellerin to death. She received 47 wounds during the attack, which occurred in her Hollywood home. The neck wound she'd sustained was so brutal that it almost severed her head, while some of the wounds in her torso were up to six inches deep. On the night of the murder, she had been getting ready to go on a date with up-and-coming Hollywood star, Aston Kutcher. On December 1st of 2005, Michael stabbed his own neighbor to death. Maria Bruno was a 32-year-old mother of four, living in the same gated apartment complex in El Monte as the serial slayer, when she was attacked and stabbed 17 times. Finally, in 2008, Michael's luck ran out. On April 28th, he attempted to kill another neighbor, Michelle Murphy, by attacking her in her Santa Monica home. However, she managed to fight him off, and his blood was left behind at the crime scene. Just months later, on June 6th, the Santa Monica police arrested the 32-year-old perpetrator. On July 7th of 2011, Michael was charged with the first-degree murder of Trisha, who is believed to have been his first victim. At some point during his interviews with law enforcement, he reportedly told them that just because 10 women had been killed and his DNA was present at the scene, didn't mean he had murdered anyone. This has led some investigators to speculate that he has more victims than we currently know of. But at this time, Michael has not been linked to further murders. The California media dubbed Michael the Hollywood Ripper and the Chiller Killer. He was charged with the murders of Maria and Ashley, as well as Trisha. Following several long delays, his trial began in May of 2019. During the trial, Ashton Kutcher took to the stand. He had last spoken to Ashley at 8.24 p.m. on the night of her murder. He told her that he was running late, and she replied she was just out of the shower. By the time he finally turned up at her house, he thought she had left because he received no answer when he knocked on the door. Looking into the home, he saw what he thought were red wine stains on the floor, as Ashley had hosted a party the previous evening. The following day, upon finding out about her death, Kutcher contacted authorities to let them know he had been at the home the day before. Michael's defense was not very convincing. When speaking about Michelle Murphy's case, his lawyers claimed that Michael suffered from split personality disorder and that he didn't know he was in Michelle's apartment. He also apparently apologized before he fled the scene. His team also portrayed him as a victim of abuse, and a neuropsychologist discovered that he'd spent much of his childhood in special education because of his behavioral problems. Michael was abusive and angry as a youngster, and as an adult, was a serial cheater. Part of the reason his trial took so long to occur is that he repeatedly fired his lawyers, and even once attempted to represent himself. In August of 2019, Michael was convicted on all counts. The death penalty was recommended, although more delays have appeared in the years since. In 2021, he appeared in an LA court as his attorneys made the case that the new DA is opposed to the death penalty and that California Governor Gavin Newsom has placed a moratorium on executions. The lawyers have said that Michael, sentenced to life behind bars, would die in prison anyway, so the death penalty was unnecessary. He will be sentenced in July of 2021, and he is currently awaiting trial for Trisha's murder. In 2015, the LAPD attempted to identify the woman in the photos that we showed at the beginning of this case. They believe she was a possible victim of Michael's who hadn't yet been found. The images were found on his hard drive shortly after his arrest, and investigators became concerned when they realized she looked similar to some of Michael's other victims. The photos are believed to have been taken between 2001 and 2003, somewhere in California, and were made public in 2008, but the woman in question never came forward. Tips about her identity did not pan out either. It is unclear if this woman has been identified in the years since, or if the authorities are still searching for her. Online sleuths have suggested that this was a girlfriend or wife of Michael's, as he had relationships and was once even married during the time of his murders. Nonetheless, Knowing the horrific nature of Michael's crimes make these images eerie, 
and unnerving. Matthew Weaver Jr. 21-year-old Matthew Weaver Jr. of Simi Valley, California should have been excited about entering adulthood. Instead, instead, he was experiencing what appears to be a crisis of some sort in the lead-up to his strange disappearance in 2018. Shortly before Matthew's vanishing, he moved out of the home he had shared with his stepmother and into his own apartment in Granada Hills, California. According to one source, he had been kicked out, although it's unclear if this information is correct. He had also broken up with his long-term girlfriend, Vanessa. These sudden changes had made his life turbulent, and the only steady things within it were his job and his friends. Matthew worked with his father, Matthew Weaver Sr., as a linesman for a telephone pole construction company at the time of his disappearance. Matthew's ex-girlfriend noted that the 21-year-old had begun to drink more following his move to his new apartment. His friends noticed this too, and he was a near-constant party-goer. They then saw him begin to dabble in drugs. He started using LSD and cocaine on a regular basis. Matthew told his friends that his substance issues were starting to become bothersome as they were becoming more and more apparent. Not only were drugs interfering with his job as he was starting to miss shifts, but he had also reportedly been caught using by his father. Things took a turn, however, when, in the months leading up to Matthew's disappearance, he began asking around for a gun. His friends refused to help him get one, and he was unable to purchase one himself, so he asked if he could borrow one from his father, or if his father would buy him one, but Matthew Sr. refused. On August 9th of 2018, Matthew slept late after another night of partying. At around 6 p.m., he drove to his work to pick up $400 in cash from his father. While here, he asked if he could take a photo of his gun, and his father agreed. Matthew posted the image of the gun in his hand to Snapchat with the words, Game Over, on it. At 9 p.m., Matthew called a friend named Melissa Sanchez. He picked her up from her home in Chatsworth, and the pair drove to Walmart, purchased gas, and then drove to an unidentified location where they purchased cocaine. From here, they headed to a marijuana dispensary. Together, the two sat in Matthew's car outside of Melissa's home. According to Melissa, the two were new friends, which is why she found it odd and awkward when Matthew began emotionally venting to her in the car before crying. She eventually left the 21-year-old alone in his car at 5 a.m. At 5.15 a.m., Matthew turned off the 101 freeway and got onto Mulholland Highway. At 6.57, he stopped at a parking lot at Stunt Road in Topanga Canyon. This area was a popular lookout spot that the 21-year-old was very familiar with, as his ex, Vanessa, claimed he visited it frequently. Matthew sat in the lot for about 16 minutes. At 7.15 a.m., he opened the large, unlocked metal gate that led to an asphalt road, named Topanga Tower Motorway, which later forked and led to a large microwave tower that was being built at the time. CCTV from the area showed that Matthew did indeed drive down this dirt road, and he was the only one who did. His car was later found at the end of the road, which was so narrow that one of his tires was hanging off the edge of the mountain. The front of his car had been blocked by a small boulder, and there was nowhere to turn the vehicle around. At 8.21 a.m., the 21-year-old attempted to call his father. However, Matthew Sr. had no signal at the time, so he missed the call. A few hours later, at 11.48, he called Melissa, who was unable to answer because she was at work. She did, however, text him, asking what was up. Matthew replied, quote, like some crazy is going on shit going on. And then, quote, I just to talk while I have the chance. His phone was either turned off or ran out of battery after this message. Melissa asked him if he was okay, but Matthew never replied. Between 7.28 and 11.48 a.m., Matthew remained in the same area. His whereabouts since he last contacted Melissa, however, are unknown. He has never been seen or heard from again. A publication named the local Malibu reported that on August 11th at around 1am, 
Cries for help were heard in the Rosa's Overlook area, a section of the trail near to where Matthew's car was found. While a search ensued, no trace of the 21-year-old or anyone else was found, and scent dogs reportedly lost the trail they'd been following. The only clues in Matthew's case come from drone images of the area in which he went missing. 797 photos were taken by the drone's pilot, and a reward is being offered to those who can find relevant clues by analyzing the images. This method was used to find a white, torn t-shirt with dried blood on it, and a hat also with dried blood on it. While the hat conclusively belongs to Matthew, the t-shirt remains unconfirmed as belonging to the 21-year-old. Friends and family of Matthew's do not believe he'd take his own life. However, given his erratic behavior, his emotional state, and his final Snapchat message, which read, game over, it may not be the most far-fetched theory. Other speculation includes that Matthew got into a fight with a construction worker while on the site of the tower, as laborers there were known to be hostile. Meanwhile, the 21-year-old's new friend, Melissa, reportedly had gang connections. She was the last one to hear from Matthew, and the last one to see him alive, prompting some to question whether or not she had something to do with his sudden disappearance. It's also been asked why he chose to speak with her specifically, rather than his other, much closer friends. Matthew's friends have said they believe he wanted a gun for his own protection, not so he could take his own life. They believe he posted the image to Snapchat to let people know he had one, not as some kind of final goodbye. Matthew's family and friends continue to look for answers. If you would like to help analyze the drone images, you can do so at matthewweaver.tips. Matthew was last seen on August 10th of 2018 at the Topanga Tower motorway near Rosa's Overlook, above the Backbone Trail and Hondo Canyon areas of California. He was 21 years old at the time and has brown hair and brown eyes. He stands at 5 foot 10 and weighs around 130 pounds. If you have any information about his whereabouts, you can contact the Los Angeles Regional Crime Stoppers on 1-800-222-TIPS. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon for as little as $2 each month. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.